And I, uh, I have, I'm in the unfortunate position of not been fortunate enough to actually attend all of the talks. So I'm not sure exactly how non sequitur this talk is going to be, but I'm hoping that it's actually going to be uh, sort of continuing the tradition of sort of understanding uh, the way in which the way in which we uh, we construct online identities and the extent to which those are actually valuable um, for studying human behavior. Um, and so in my lab, what we're primarily interested in is um, understanding human behavior through online data. And what I want to do today is, is motivate that, uh, motivate the reason that, that we even investigate that, and, and show you some of the results that we can obtain in terms of understanding um, how people um, construct and communicate their identities online, um, and how we can build machinery that actually detects that, and that actually measures that, and what we can do with it in terms of learning about real world behavior. So um, by way of motivation, uh, sort of as a computer scientist, uh, we can we can wax philosophically about many things that we know nothing about, and uh, one of those that I would that I would put at the top of the list is sort of thinking about sort of the big problems that uh, that are that are out there that we have to solve. And when I look at a lot of the challenges that we as a civilization have to solve, many of them seem um, sort of deeply social in nature, oriented around the idea of of relocation. So if you think about um, uh, social unrest, if you think about climate change, if you think about poverty and education, these are all fundamentally questions of resource allocation and, and, uh, and social mobilization. Um, and, and if you look at a lot of the uh, core questions that we ask, in, even in uh, social engineering, things that things is around the, the smart city, all of these also revolve around resource allocation. So when we talk about the smart economy, we we want to we want to allocate resources uh, carefully. Um, if we talk about a smart the smart environment, we want the environment to actually respond to the people that are using it um, according to the to the de the, the needs that they have. Um, we want populaces and transportation to be more carefully integrated so that we have buses where we need them when we want them and taxis arrive where we need them. We want to be able to actually follow the center of mass of a city. All of this requires being responsive to resource allocation. And if you think about the sort of the arc of engineering, we have solved many resource allocation problems. I mean, resource allocation comes down to, solving resource allocation comes down to figuring out what the demand is, figuring out what the supply is, and then connecting them up. Um, and, and if you, and we have, we, have, we have largely solved the logistics problem of resource allocation. We can move things around very effectively. But in terms of figuring out what's needed where and when, um, that remains a huge open problem. And the question that we're really trying to get at is the extent to which we can really understand uh, who, needs, who needs resources, who they are, and where resources are, and how we can actually connect them. And we're starting from a very basic, basic uh, sort of question, which is we don't actually know who is out there. If you think about a city, um, it's quite remarkable that this complex system that we live in actually even operates, because we know so little about it on a day-to-day -day level. We you know, take census information, but we really don't know about how people are commuting around, where people are actually moving on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is um, this is basically at the heart of resource allocation um, in the real world. Now, of course, resources come in a lot of different forms. Um, you can have, you know, very, very concrete things like food and water and uh, and garbage and these sorts of things. But when we t start talking about social, uh, sort of social continuity and and keeping the fabric of society um, together, you know, we can think about things like, uh, you know, the attention that people are giving to different things. We can talk about political. Uh, resources, votes, political attention, political time. We can think about money uh, in terms of the economy. All of these are different resources. And the case that I want to make is that we can use people's behavior online, in particular social media, in order to actually um, get uh, a, really, a really strong and, and good understanding of how these resources are moving and what, what people need and, uh, and where these resources are. And so I want to start with somewhat of a glib example, but it's one that we, we did in my lab. So um, uh, in order to do this, we need to talk about Christmas. So for those of you who are not familiar, the way that Christmas works uh, is you have the population of the world, and everybody wishes for something. <clears throat> and these arrive uh, 
uh, with Santa Claus, and then Santa Claus on the 25th of December makes rounds and delivers everything that everybody wants. Um, and there are companies out there that would absolutely kill for the wish list of Santa Claus because it's basically people are basically generating uh, uh, sales forecasts, or at least this would be the conjecture, right? People say what they want as long as they're not wishing for things like yachts. Um, they're in some sense giving indication as to what what is going to what the products are that people actually want to want to have. So it would be ideal if we could actually acquire somehow acquire this list that Santa Claus gets. Now it happens that nowadays people post their lists not only uh, directly to Santa Claus by post, but they also will post them to Twitter. So um, starting in around late October, November, people will in large droves start actually making posts about what they want for Christmas on Twitter and on Facebook and on various social media platforms. And so the question is, can we actually take uh, measurements off of Twitter and reconstruct in some sense what people are actually wanting. Can we actually line that up? So to give some sense, I'm not sure how many people here use Twitter, but just, just to make sure we're all on the same page, the way Twitter works is a particular kind of social, uh, social platform um, that is uh, that's basically, it, it's considered a broadcast platform. So here's sort of, here's you, if, if you have a Twitter account. And when you generate content, um, it's called microblogging. When you generate content, you generate a message that's about 140 characters or less in length. And um, in general, you have no control over where it goes. It goes to everybody who signed up to follow you. And so it's microblogging because it's this tiny piece of content and it goes to everybody. Um, and then, you know, what do you see? Well, you see everybody that you subscribe to, so all of your friends. And these are the these are the sort of unfortunate terms that are actually used for this. So we have friends and we have followers. Um, and, and, this is, and so this is how information propagates through Twitter. Uh, and of course, you can have things like reciprocal ties where uh, you follow someone. So you're following this person, and this person is also following you. And so that's a reciprocal tie. And often, things like reciprocal ties are, are reasonable proxies for people that you actually know. Because you, know, you have to know that person for them to follow you, and they have to know you. So like, for instance, President Barack Obama is not following my Twitter account. Um, though I may follow him, may be interested in the stuff that he generates, but he presumably is not interested in what I'm generating. Um, and so the, you know, the, the, one of the phenomena that, that is worth being aware of is something called retweets. So a tweet is one of these microblog posts. So somebody posts something that says, like, check it out and puts a link after it, um, some, you know, high value piece of information. Um, and, uh, and that information is broadcast. So this person has, has users all through here. I see it. So I receive it in my account. I read it. And I say, wow, that really is high value information. I want to propagate that. So what I do is I retweet it. And so there's this convention where you can have RTs or various things that flag this as being information that I'm propagating. But nonetheless, Twitter is a platform in which information can propagate. And that also is a is sort of a valuable signal of information. So this is, this is what your interface looks like. How many of you actually use Twitter? So far. Okay, awesome. So for any of you, this is just a review. Um, and so here's, here's sort of this news feed. Oh, awesome. Okay, excellent. Yes, perfect. So it's all, we've, we've closed the loop, right? Talking about Twitter to be tweeted. Um, okay, so back to our paradigm. So we've got these people wishing for things for Christmas. They are telling Santa Claus what they want. They are also putting it on Twitter. Of course, the problem is, is that we need to pull it off Twitter. And so the question would be, how do we find these tweets? What do they look like? What kind of information do we get? So we did a very simple simple experiment. And we simply looked for all tweets that, that uh, satisfied the following expression, I want blank for Christmas, or uh, for Christmas, I want blank, or you know some such forms like that. So, so we made people fill in the blank. And, and so this is run, this is run back in Christmas of 2012. So this was two years ago. Um, and so here's what we got. Uh, anybody want to hazard a guess at what the top wish was? Uh, 2012. Don't think too hard. I don't think you're going to be able to get it. What's that? Pony. Pony. Pony's not a bad shot. All right. <laughs> top wish was. <laughs> Justin Bieber. Um, so this is this is uh, the actual number of, of uh, wish counts that we saw, and so this is you know unfiltered. But 
what we can see is that uh, Justin Bieber was actually the top wish by far, which was in some sense a very depressing result. Um, but, uh, but, and so this list is actually popular with all sorts of interesting stuff. And it's worth actually looking at it in order to sort of get an understanding of, of what we have to deal with when we start working with social media data. And, and that's the real reason that I'm putting this up here. So Justin Bieber, um, well, that's obvious. So, you know, you get, you get huge, like, 14-year-old girl signal on Twitter. Um, and then Hippo, we've got Hippo and My Two Front Teeth. What are those? Why are people wishing for those? That's right. So there's, there's songs. There's Christmas songs. And so all I want for Christmas is my two front teeth. There's another song, I want a hippopotamus for Christmas. Christmas. There's another one, New Year's Day. Um, and then you have all sorts of other interesting things. So for instance, you have boyfriend. And then way down here, you have girlfriend. So you can sort of reflect on, on what's going on there. Um, the, uh, and then you have things like for you to follow me. So people are actually wishing for um, basically more Twitter engagement. Um, and then you get some credible things. So you have people wishing for puppies and iPads and iPods and money and various things. So you do get wishes in here, but there's a tremendous amount of other stuff going on. And, and I, would, I would caution us about saying that it's garbage, because it's not, it's not garbage. It's just noise in the way that we want to think about it. It's actually very interesting. From a sociological perspective, it's, there's all sorts of interesting stuff going on in here. One, one thing worth mentioning, there's this fantastic t-shirt. So when we started getting this, when this started coming through, I was like, fantastic t-shirt? Why are so many people wishing for a fantastic t-shirt? And why the use of the word fantastic? That's so curious. And it took, a while, it took a bit of digging and to find out that actually there was a company running a promotion where if you tweeted that you wanted a fantastic t-shirt for Christmas, you were entered in a raffle, and then if you, they would pull your Twitter handles out of, out of this raffle, and if you got pulled, then you would win. So anyway, we have companies also messing with the content that's being generated on Twitter. So the, the problem that we have is that we effectively have all of this sort of noise, and in order to really understand what's going on, we have to go through the of really trying to actually take this un, unstructured wish content and then categorize it um, and deal with all of these issues. You know, it's wildly unstructured. There's lots of words that aren't in the dictionary. I mean, to give you some sense, th these are the kind of kind of tweets that we had to look at. All I want for Christmas, it's you, baby with a tilde. Um, for Christmas, all I want is Visa cards. I got a lot of school. Blah 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 blah. Um, these are these things are not necessarily even easy to parse. Uh, the Fashion Brigade, all I work for is, is a unicorn bike attach them. So this is actually truncated, so a human being can actually f complete that. But a computer does not necessarily know that that means attachment. Um, and so actually trying to figure out, trying to actually resolve that is difficult. All I want for Christmas, this person has chosen to use a semicolon rather than a colon um, in order to start their list. The Cool Grays um, is virtually unencodable unless you know slang. It took me digging through Craigslist in order to figure that these were sneakers. Um, and then all I want for Christmas is dun 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 whey. So this person wants some sort of protein shake, I think. And they introduced it using all of these dun dun duns, which you'd have to the computer would have to parse and know was not things to wish for themselves. What's that? Oh, see? I'm still learning things about this data. I mean, but this stuff is, it's difficult to actually parse. Like, even for a human being, you sit down with this stuff and you're like, what is, what, is, what am I looking at? Um, and, so, and so that is to simply sort of motivate the problem. We want to learn about the world, but people are doing their darndest to actually make it completely undecipherable. But here's the dream. So if we wanted to learn about the real world, the way we would go out and do it first, right now, using current technologies, we would go out and we'd survey. This is the way censuses are, are run. This is the way that we actually put people on the street in order to figure out what kind of public transport people are taking or what they're doing. Um, it's awesome uh, as a technology because, and it's very well established, because you know who you're talking to. You've got a known sample. And you get very structured information. You have your little questionnaire. You go up to the person and you say, what did you eat yesterday? Do you, know, do you ride this bus every day or every other day? What is your schedule? So on and so forth. You get all the information that you want. The problem is that super artificial. 
Um, in terms of you are coming up to somebody, you uh, they don't necessarily want to talk to you when you're surveying them, um, and uh, they may not remember the answers to what you're saying. So there's there's sort of known survey bias. So you can imagine if somebody so there, there's actually known survey bias that is that, that concerns the following. If I come up to you and I say, "How many hamburgers did you eat last week?" and you ate 10 hamburgers, there will be a little red light that goes off in your head that says, this person is going to judge me if I say that I'd say 10 hamburgers. So I will simply change that number, and then I will report one hamburger or zero hamburgers. So that this person, the surveyor, doesn't actually think that I'm like a, a hamburger glutton. But the problem is, is that I'm not, I'm not there to judge you. I'm there to just get information from you about your hamburger eating addict, uh, uh, not addicts, uh, habits. And so, um, yeah, there you go. And so, uh, and so the question is, how do you actually get proper survey information if people are actually modifying their answers because they know they're being surveyed? And so there, there's sort of huge endemic problems with the way that with, with surveying itself as a phenomenon. And of course, it's also really expensive to try to run these surveys. So if you look at social media, and we're going to talk a lot about Twitter. If you look at social media, you've got Twitter. It's awesome because it's in the moment. So when, when I'm at Starbucks and somebody spills their coffee on my shoes, I tweet about it right then. You find out about me being upset in Starbucks at that moment. Um, it's incredibly cheap uh, from the standpoint that all you need is an internet connection. And you get this, this really wonderful dimension of social context. So I can actually see who you follow. I can see who follows you. I can learn something about sort of the people that you surround yourself with online. Which, by the way, should not be confused with who you surround yourself with offline. But it can sometimes be an, an, an informative proxy. And then finally, it's real time. So we get this feed all the time. So if we can develop a technology that can actually pull information about populations in, uh, off of Twitter, this is going to be real-time information about populations. The, the challenges, however, is that it's completely unstructured. So we're not, people are not all answering the same question at the same time. Not everybody's telling me what they're eating. Not everybody's telling me what they're uh, wearing or how they're exercising or where they are. Um, and of course, it's much harder to actually control for my sample. But we're going to try to actually get, try to prove to ourselves that some of that can be handled. And a lot of that requires drilling into understanding who is online. And so that's really what we're going to be focusing on, the extent to which we can figure out who you are online. And by the way, I should say, please jump in with questions at any point if you do. Um, the challenge is that people generate all of this content, all this random content. We need to figure out who they are, and it's somewhat you know, obvious, but you are more than what you say, particularly on social media. And so in some sense, we have to defeat whatever people are trying to actually uh, communicate explicitly by looking for more subtle signals. And so you know, if you take my public Twitter account, um, here I am. Uh, just by looking at my Twitter account, what can you actually figure out about me? You know, what can we actually learn about me? And there, there are sort of obvious things, and there are non-obvious things. And of course, there's the question of what, what you can figure out, and then what a computer can figure out. So for instance, you, know, you can look at my profile picture, and OK, well, I'm presumably a guy. Um, I, I am saying that I'm a professor of computer science. I'm sort of stating some of my interests. Um, you can look at my tweets and see whether I talk about particular things. So you can kind of drill into some of this. Yeah. Um, now, you said you were more than what we say, but is it not also possible that we're, we're different than what we say? Like, you, do you, you still kind of run into the social desirability problem that you do with the surveys because, you know, I'm, I might have eaten 10 hamburgers, but I might only tweet that I ate five because I know people are going to be looking at it. No, it's very true. Actually, you, you in some sense, deal with the the same, if not greater, uh, kinds of social, uh, sort of social in inhibitory signals. And actually, you can deal with different ones, right? Because people can construct online personas that they try to actually maintain, which can also be problematic. So, and you know, a lot of these things are open, open questions. A lot of what we're going to try to explore right now is the extent to which we even can pull this information out. Because um, what we would like to be able to argue is that the sort of big N the big end sample of Twitter that we can get is going to somehow sort of buffer us from some of these effects. Um, but I think for certain variables, it's going to be more useful than for others. So, you know, for things like eating habits or like sexual history or these kinds of things, social media may not tell us anything. And so we have to be very clear about what kind of things we want to obtain. There are some things, though, that I would argue are more difficult to hide in social media. 
primarily because people, uh, by and large, are consumers of this technology, not like very careful, uh, careful users of them. And so things like location, things like uh, daily habits, like uh, commuting habits, these things show up in sort of the way that you move. And you can turn all this stuff off, but a lot of people don't know to turn it off or don't particularly care to turn it off. The challenge is that when we want to go learn about something like gender, when we want a computer to actually figure out the gender of a user, the political orientation of a user, their ethnicity, or their, you know, their location, this is what we're working with. These are not my tweets, but these are, these are real tweets that I pulled, pulled off of Twitter. So, and a lot of people generate tweets that pretty much just look like this. You know, I bring all my sexy professors in Apple on the first day with two periods at the end. I don't know what those two periods are. Then some comment about poker, a one-year-old dog is physically as mature as a 15-year-old human. I mean, these are uninformative tweets. It's like you would read one of these tweets. Well, I, I don't even understand the context behind these. But can we actually use this to learn something about these users? So here's the machine learning. So, so we're going to use machine learning. So I'm a computer scientist, and so I'm, I'm interested in finding ways of getting the computer to think about this in an automated way. And so the paradigm that we're going to use is going to look something like this. We're going to take a bunch of users, and so here what I've done is the, the United States has a wonderful sort of political system for doing this classification because there's sort of two major parties. So, um, so what I've labeled here are Democrats and Republicans, um, uh, and what we've and, and so what we have here we have a bunch of Twitter users that we can assign a label to. We've got a bunch of users of each from each political party. They're described to each one, and what I'm doing is I'm extracting a set of features. This is a feature vector. And in each of these sort of spots, you can imagine that this is just a list of, of attributes. So it might be how many, how many times they mention the word Democrat, how many times they mention the word Republican, uh, how many people they follow, uh, how many tweets they've generated. You know, anything that you can turn into a number is basically um, a feature. And so I'm building these feature vectors, and they're all the same. So I have a bunch of numerical features that I've, uh, that I've basically taken all the content that these users are generating and distilled it into a bunch of numerical values. And we're going to plug that into uh, a machine learning framework to build something called a classifier. And this classifier is um, effectively serves the purpose of understanding the relationship, the complex relationship between all of these numbers. And the computer doesn't really care what these numbers are. But it's going to learn the relationship between these numbers and these labels. And so for those of you who may have worked with linear regression models or things like this, linear regression is a statistical, it's effectively a statistical classifier in some sense, right? It's going to come up with a relationship between a set of observables, uh, a set of features and a set of observables. Um, in, in the case of machine learning, we, we favor things that, that can be a bit more flexible than, than, uh, than linear regression, and so we use things like support vector machines, uh, naive Bayes classifiers, um, boosted decision trees. There's a whole handful of these. But suffice to say, you plug the same stuff into it, and so you can use many, you can pick up many of these machines and apply them uh, for this purpose. You build your classifier, and the classifier does the following. It'll take a set of this set, same feature vector, and it'll try to figure out what that label looks like, simply based on what it's seen before. And so it'll tell you about gender, or political orientation, or whatever it is that you've trained it on. <coughs> now there's, there's a catch to, to this. And there's always a catch when using machine learning. And that is, you have to start with training data. You have to have training data. And so one of the big challenges when actually trying to learn about um, these features and these labels online and the relationships that they have is finding a data set of people that you, uh, that you know these labels for. I need to know a bunch of people who are more Republican or more Democrat in order to label them that way so that I can learn about them. And, that's, and that is itself a very challenging problem. I'll talk about it for some of the features that we'll, that we'll discuss, but Suffice to say, it's, it's tricky. Um, now, in terms of what we put in here, so there's a lot of the research that goes on in this field that has to do with what we put into these feature vectors. And so you know, the, 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 there's some obvious ones to put in. So you put in a bunch of words. You put in the words that they use. So, and in general, you've got your two classes or three classes of, of groups, uh, of individuals. So you've got your, um, your, uh, your, your Democrats and Republicans, or your liberals and conservatives, or your, uh, you know, your different, uh, different people from different geographic regions. 
And so you know the words that are sort of most expressive of people being there because you can say, well, what words occur here that don't occur elsewhere? And so we can find those, and those, those are top words. You can do the same thing with hashtags, with the, which are the labels that people use uh, on, on Twitter and Facebook and now elsewhere. Um, mentions are people, uh, the, the, the fact that they mention other people. And then stems, cosems, and diagrams are sort of very low-level um, syntactic structures, just sort of the co-occurrences between characters or the endings of words. Um, and these actually end up being very, very powerful, surprisingly, for, for various things. Um, we can also think about more meta features. So we can think about things like the, the number of tweets or the retweets that people generate. So how engaged they are with the platform and what kind of engagement they have, kind of uh, content they generate, so the, the extent to which they post links, use emoticons of different sorts. And then you can think about sort of what their neighborhood looks like. And so if we, if we go in and we try to classify these features, some very basic features, uh, age, gender, and political orientation, this is the accuracy that we get if we use basically as many features as we can come up with for a given user. So we get about 75% accuracy for age, uh, about 80% accuracy for gender, and 90% accuracy for political orientation. Um, in order to actually test this, I'm not going to go into the details of, of how we actually ran these studies, but, but I do want to comment on just how, how we find p labeled users to learn this information on. So for age, uh, well, actually, let me, let me put it out there. How, how would you find a labeled set of users? So the problem is we have a whole bucket of like thousands and millions of Twitter users. You've got about 70 million active Twitter users. And you want to find a bunch of males and females. You want to find a bunch of people who you can ascribe an age to, a very precise age. Um, you want to find some people who are you know, belong to a particular party or have a particular political orientation, how would we find, how would you do it for age? What are some thoughts? What's that? People rarely declare it in their profile. None of, uh, yeah, they, they very rarely declare it. So finally we can't get it there. So you could sub-select a population that you knew this information about. That's for sure. So we could build a data set that consisted of Katy Perry, like Lady Gaga, Barack Obama, Stephen Harper. You know, what would be the issue with such a data set, though? They don't actually operate their own social media. Yeah, they don't operate their own. What? They don't operate their own social media. Really? No, you're absolutely right. So, I mean, not only do they not operate their own social media, but even for those that might, like Kanye West, I assume that he does not have a PR agent that generates that kind of stuff. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, even for people who don't, uh, they don't necessarily act like normal people. Well, you never know. Yeah, exactly. I mean, given what we've seen, it's, it's hard to say. But certainly this sample would be a, an odd sample. And so that would be of some concern. Yeah. You ask the NSA. All right. I, you know, I haven't tried that, and I'm not sure they'd feed the information back to me. But we could, we could reach out to them. Um, yeah. Can you match it to the Facebook profile or another social media? So there's, there is, there has been some work on matching this. The matching is its own problem because people use different names and so forth. Um, uh, it's not been super successful in terms of uh, people, except inside the the platforms. But. So the way that we did this, um, and uh, by the way, there's no right answer, I mean, but you have to be creative about the way that you get this. The way we did it is we looked for people who wished themselves or were wished a birthday. Happy birthday. So um, people would say, happy birthday to me, I'm 21 years old. Or your friend would say, happy birthday, I'm so, so glad that we've known each other for however long, you're now 32 years old or something. <laughs> we, can, we can pull these ages out. Right? We, can, we can pull these ages out. Um, it may enrich for narcissists. That's the only potential issue. Uh, people who are very interested in sort of announcing their presence um, and, and their age. Uh, but we couldn't find a, a better way around that. Uh, and it seems, and when you test the, their actual, the content they generate, they tend to look like everybody else. This is the other nice thing that you can do. You can actually sort of do it as a statistical analysis and determine that, yes, there's no difference in terms of word distributions and so forth. Um, so that's how you get age. 
uh, you can imagine that there's a, there's a sampling bias, though. So if you look at the number of ages that are announced, where do you think the peaks are? 29. 29? You, know, you don't see it at 29. No. Where would you see the peaks? 16, 21. Yeah, exactly. 16, 21, tw and then you hit at, at, every, at every five, you hit them. 25, 30, 35, because for some reason, fives are good numbers. Fives and even and, uh, and and every decade. So in any case, so you have to you have to address that. But in any case, when you account for that, that's how you build this data set and you get this performance. Um, gender. So how do we do gender? What are some ways for doing gender? What's that? With binarity. With binarity. <laughs> yes, we'll make it binary, for sure. But how do we actually recognize whether a user is male or female? Yeah, that, I mean, presumably you could get some signal off of that. That'd be a lot of work. There, I think there are some lower hanging fruits in terms of the way we can do this. Pictures. pictures. So pictures would be a great way to do it. Um, and, and that's one way that we found that you can get some pretty, pr very accurate information. However, interestingly enough, it's highly culturally sensitive. So if you go to Japan, it's very hard to use profiles on all users um, because they post so many anime uh, anime pictures uh, on there, yeah. Uh, yes, you can use names. So if you're, and, and actually names and profile pictures are sort of the strongest ones that we've found and that are used in literature, and so that's how you would actually go and construct some sort of gender, gender-based data set. Political orientation, um, I won't go into because it gets actually really dicey in terms of how you get this information, but um, it can be done. And uh, actually, when you do it right, this number falls dramatically, uh, but we won't. We won't worry about that. Um, so you can get that performance when you look at a single user. One of the things I want to highlight is that we code our identities online, not just through what we generate, but who we surround ourselves with. And we do this so well that actually, for the most part, you do not need to look at what you actually generate. All you need is what your friends generate. And so I want to show that to you very quickly. The idea is that uh, many features are homophilic, meaning that you have users um, and uh, you have users and you have the individuals that follow them and the idea is that many of your friends will share the same label that you do. And so what we're going to do is we're simply going to augment our classifier. So rather than using my feature vector, we can build my, the feature vector for my neighborhood and we can run it through the same system. And of course, you can. I just like to point out that that is not an obvious problem because there are many ways you can define your neighborhood. You could look at everybody. You could look at the most popular people in the neighborhood, the least popular people in your neighborhood, the people who you reciprocally follow, the people you mention the most, the people you don't mention the most. There's like lots of different ways of defining who's around you. And so it's actually a challenging or, or an open question itself. But we're going to sample a couple of these. And then, of course, question, there's another question, which is if we want to use your information and your neighbor's information, how can we merge that? So we can we have a couple of different ways of doing this. Here's our data set. Um, so this is what we saw before. This is the performance we had previously. And here's all of these different ways of measuring and engaging your neighbor information. These are just using your neighborhood. This is averaging your information with your neighbor's information, and this is actually doubling up your features. So this is your information plus your, neighbor's inf your neighborhood information. And a, key th a couple of key things fall out of this. First off, if I add your information, I significantly boost performance. So I get 5% imp uh, improvement here. I get, interestingly, I get almost no improvement here, um, and I get uh, some improvement in political orientation. Why don't I get much improvement in gender? Do you think? Well, probably because we don't necessarily just people gender. Right. Gender is not deeply homophilic on social media and actually day-to-day -day life. People hang out with men and women, right? So it's not as though knowing the knowing that label for those directly around you is going to be a strong signal for your own gender. Um, the uh, the other point that I want to make is that let's look at just neighbor information, neighbor information alone. So here's age. Here's the accuracy with which I can predict your age using just your neighbor information. Um, I can get that basically the same performance without having any access to your information. The same thing goes for political orientation, which basically suggests that you can make your account private if you want. 
Um, but if I can get those, uh, a sample of those around you, I can actually get as much information about you as I had before which is a fairly profound comment about just how strongly we encode many of these sort of uh, features of our identities in our social networks. So the last couple of minutes, I want to talk about uh, actually getting measurements of the real world uh, using social media. So I talked briefly about uh, Christmas. I want to finish up that study and actually uh, complete telling you about it. This measurement, we found out that Justin Bieber is the most popular thing to have in the entire universe. Um, and uh, But we really wanted to get at an estimate of things that people actually could buy. Right? We wanted to predict sales. And by the way, people were not wishing for Justin Bieber's album. They were just wishing for Justin Bieber. Um, so that was, a, that was a bit of a problem. Uh, so what we decided to look at was a product sales in a particular sector where social media talks about things a lot, and that is um, video games. So people talk about video games a lot on social media, and we were going to see the extent to which we could predict unit sales in the fourth quarter of 2012. Um, and what we find, if you take the, um, the number of wishes, and this is the number of wishes that you get, get for a Wii, for an Xbox 360, and for a PlayStation 3, this is the number of unit sales. This is the error in terms of, uh, of uh, this is the prediction error. We were off by, we were, we were off in terms of predicting the actual relative unit sales in the fourth quarter by approximately, in total, about uh, 12%. Now, this is a particularly interesting year to look at video game sales because the Xbox had just come out with the Kinect. And analysts, every analyst out there was saying that, that the Kinect was absolutely going to kill Wii sales, the sales of the Wii. And so early on, we saw that the Wii was actually leading the Xbox 360. And so I was like, oh, crap, this is not good. This is like, we're going we're gonna to get everything wrong. Well, lo and behold, when you actually go and you look at the unit sales, um, the Wii outsold the Xbox 360 despite the Kinect having been released that year. And so not only did we get highly accurate estimates of unit sales, but we also beat pretty much every analyst out there simply by looking at the extent to which people were talking about these products. So it suggests that there's actually a very high value signal embedded in this. Now, of course, it's a bit hard to get at. But if one can do it, as in the case of what we did here, it seems as though we can really make some strong assertions about what's happening in the real world. The final case I'd like to talk about is looking at is reconstructing census data. So you know, I started out talking about understanding the city as a complex system. Now I want to return to that and think about the extent to which we can use social media to do that. And so we ran a very simple case study um, looking at whether we could reconstruct particular census figures using Twitter data alone. So census, the census costs some umpteen billion dollars to run, and it's run every 10 years. So it's very expensive and it's very slow information to get. Can we actually reconstruct some of the information that we get from census effectively using only social media information? Um, <clears throat> and so we decided something that, that would be fairly easy to get information off of social media before. We looked at commuter population, the extent to which people commute by, by car, by a bike, or by public transit, which is, of course, something that's highly valuable for cities to know because they need to know how to invest in infrastructure. And we were interested in looking at not just commuter populations, but also the breakdown of commuter populations. At the time, we had um, uh, really accurate gender classifiers. And so we had census figures for Toronto. We got census figures for Toronto. We used Toronto rather than Montreal or, uh, uh, or local cities where we live, primarily because of the language issue. Um, classifying multilingual users is actually much more difficult. It's a problem that we're working on. but. Um, Doing that classification gets tricky because the, they explode the vocabulary of possible terms that can be used. Um, in any case, what we, did, we went to Toronto and we pulled simply the, the, the news handles that, that broadcast information about basically different transportation techniques. So we looked at traffic, we looked at public transport notices, and we looked at uh, commuting. And um, then we pulled all the individuals who followed those accounts. And we classified their genders. So we just classified by male, female. <clears throat> and and what we found is, and what we found is that there actually is a correlation between what you see on Twitter and what you see in, in the census data. And so I'm not going to claim that these numbers actually line up. So what you can compare is car to car, bike to bike, uh, public to public, and bike to bike. I'm not going to claim that these numbers line up. 
um, there's a great deal of work that we need to do in terms of cleaning up the noise. But what you can see is that the actual biases that are present in the census data are, are properly reflected on Twitter. And we've now reproduced this for uh, 14 other Anglophone cities, primarily just because we wanted to keep the classifier the same. And we find that this recurs over and over and over again. That actually looking at uh, commuter composition on Twitter is reflective of the, of the gross biases that we see in census data. And so that is, uh, certainly we're not going to replace the census you know, with, with these measures right now, but what it does suggest is that signal is present. And an important thing to, to, to observe is that this took us, you know, running the system to do this takes 45 minutes. And running the survey, run, running a census takes, you know, is done every 10 years. So if we can actually improve the measurements that we take, we can really start to, to obtain strong and capable measurements of the real world. Yeah. If you weighted the data for age, so I'm assuming Twitter users are much younger than people who actually fill out the census, um, maybe the result would be more similar. Maybe it would be more accurate to us. I think you're right. So that's one of the things that we're looking at, just in general, the, the platform bias that we get. So we, we're trying to correct for the platform bias as well as systemic biases in um, the kind of people who use these and what the extent to which they're, they're actually engaged with the platform. So it's not the case that, because um, depending upon the city that you're in, these can also sample from different socioeconomic uh, demographics as well. And so there's all sorts of sort of interesting things going on in this data, but for sure, I mean, we just need to do, effectively we need to work on different corrections in order to actually do that. So just to close, what, I've, what I hope that I've shown you is that for the, for the big problems that we face as a civilization, we need better ways of understanding who needs resources, where resources are being generated, and the populations that are engaged in these problems. And my hope is that social media, and, in, and more generally online data, is a way of actually trying to get at some of these to obtain real-time information about um, uh, about the kind of, uh, of problems that people are dealing with, the kind of resources that are available, and the kind of needs that need to be addressed. Um, it's very nascent work, but it's also a very exciting place to be right now because there are so many open questions and there are so many opportunities for this to really engage with problems that need to be solved. So with that, I'll close. I'll thank everyone for, for your time and attention. And if there's time, I'd be happy to take any other questions. Thanks.